Welcome to the July 25th, 2018 Your Living Brand Live show. Hi, my name is Ben Baker and my company is Your Brand Marketing. Now, nine to five, Monday to Friday, what do we do? We consult, we do workshops, and we speak on brand message, market vision, and value. What does that mean? Well, what we do is we tell your story. We want to find out who you are, what you do, why you do it, who you do it for, and really why they should care. Because when they care, you stop being a commodity. You stop being one of many and you start being one of one. You start being a trusted advisor to clients. They care about you. They want to do business with you. And they want to recommend you. And that's what this show is all about. This show is all about understanding what makes companies different. Every week, we interview a different company. We find out who they are, what they do, who they do it for, and why those people care. And this week is no different. This week, we have Rob Wilson coming to us live, and Rob is going to give us some great advice, and we had a great time talking, and I want to, I want to let him tell the story. So sit back, enjoy the interview, and I'll be back after the show. Rob, it is great having you on the show. How are you doing this morning? I am well, Ben, and thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. It is absolutely a pleasure having you on the show. You know, I love the, the stories you tell. I mean, you, you are. You're one of the storytellers that I love listening to because, you, you know, you always have one in your back pocket. You always have that smile on your face. And you know what? You make people happy. So why not? Well, well, thank you for that compliment, Ben. I, I do consider myself a storyteller. I mean, I have always enjoyed, you know, just telling whether it's an audience of one or a thousand. I enjoy, you know, telling a tale. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun and brings me a lot of pleasure. And if I can bring someone pleasure with my stories, all the better. It's a win-win. That's, that's just perfect. Now, let's get into the meat of this. You know, it, this, is, this show is all about, you know, it's all about you. You know, it's all about what do you do, who do you do it for, why do you do it? You know, why do people love you? Tell, tell me the story, Rob. You know, tell me about where you came from, you know, where you are, where are you going? You know, because it's, it's a great story to tell. Wow, that's a... <laughs> That's, that's a, a tricky one in some ways because I feel like, oh, I'm just going to start bragging about myself. But oh, it's I, all right. The, you know, it's, that's uh, the nice thing about the internet. There's always yeah. room for our heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've, um, wh how, how did I get to where I'm going? Or, I, you know, I've always enjoyed, I started out as a writer. You know, right. I've always enjoyed writing. I knew I wanted to be a writer as early as third grade. And that was kind of the direction I was, was always heading. And in some ways, there was a, 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 a speaker hiding in there, too, because mm -hmm. as a child, I remember at one point telling after um, a very good sermon from our minister uh, after church, I said to my mother, I want to be a minister. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, that's just wonderful. Because she's thinking that, you know, I was maybe having a calling. You had a calling or something like that, yeah. I just thought it was great because he told lots of jokes and got people laughing. And, <laughs> and then he got to tell some stories. Absolutely. And, and that's what I liked about him. And I didn't, and, and to me, in my mind, it wasn't that I was, you know, feeling a religious calling. I was feeling a calling to, oh, here's, here's where you get to go to yeah. tell jokes and stories. You have to be a minister. Exactly. That, that's, <laughs> that's the only reference you had. <laughs> Again, and then I got a little older, and, uh, you know, I kind of realized that that wasn't the path for me. Um, and I remember telling my father, after watching a few episodes of, uh, like, a, a lawyer program where the lawyers would get up and, and present their case and win it in, in just this dynamic way. And yeah. so I remember telling my dad, hey, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. Right. He goes, <laughs> He go and he asked me why, and I told him. He says, "Well, you should probably spend a little time with your uncle, then, mm -hmm. who's a lawyer. Go to go with him to court one day." So he arranged that. Right. And oh my God, that was the most boring day I spent <laughs> watching him. You know, <laughs> arguing his motions or presenting whatever he did. It, it was, was all policy it, and procedure. You know, there wasn't right. that, that grand articulation that we all saw in Perry Mason. Right. Exactly. Where's the where's the oration? Where's the great speeches? Where's the <laughs> and so so again so there was a 
that was kind of emerging, but it, it was finding nowhere to go. Right. And then as I got a little older, you know, when I discovered um, uh, Mark Twain. Mm-hmm. and uh, loved his books but when Absolutely. i found out he also was a speaker towards the end of his life and went around lecturing and and telling humorous stories and make i went yeah this is this is the guy i, I want to be my mentor because he's doing mostly he's telling he's a storyteller Absolutely, he's, he's writing them down, and he's 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 telling them to audiences, and and again that kind of got suppressed, and a lot of that didn't emerge until I was probably in my late thirties, mm-hmm. um, and uh, so that, that's a little bit of the early uh, days of my you know how that the storytelling and the writing emerged. Right. So this, the, the writing, the writing has always been with you, but you started writing, you know, books, what in, in your late thirties, early forties. When did, when did you first start writing your books? Oh, well, I started writing them much earlier than that. I, right. As I said, I've been writing since third grade. And sure. so, you know, there were stories I was writing and, and beginnings of books. And I, so I guess probably in my 20s, I got real serious about it and mm-hmm. started completing short stories, uh, sending them off to magazines, uh, and getting piles of rejection letters in return. <laughs> but, I, but uh, at least we knew they, wrote, they read them. You know, when you get the rejection letter, you at least know they've actually read them. <laughs> you <know>? Not true. <laughs> A lot of times you'll get these uh, form letters and, and you don't know that they've read it or not. That's now, true. A lot of times you would get, uh, not really from the short stories, but when I started sending off uh, a novel or two that I had written, I, I started getting some actual, you know, letters back from the editors that were, you know, personalized and they would say, you know, this is, you know, what I like about it. This is what I don't like about it. Or this right. is why we're not interested in that. The best one I got was back Oh, I don't remember exactly the date, but I wrote a science fiction story that was kind of long. Right. And uh, it, it, was, it was a little, and so that was the problem with it. I sent it off to Analog Science Fiction Magazine, mm-hmm. and I got the nicest letter back from the editor. He said, this is the best piece of new science fiction I have read wow. in, in years. He said, I would publish it, but it's too long. He says, however, I'm going to be in Atlanta, wh- where I live, yeah. at the, um, they call it Dragon Con now. It's a big right. sci-fi convention or fantasy convention. He says, I'm going to be there and I'd like to meet with you. Uh-huh. And I was just thrilled. So, Absolutely. you know, I met with him and uh, we talked, you know, science fiction. And science fiction was not my genre. That was a, one, a one-off. Sure. You know, I had this idea. He loved it. And I said, well, how about if I shorten it? Mm-hmm. He says, give it a shot. So I shortened it, sent it back to him. He wrote back, you know, it loses something. No. Uh, and there so, was no way to write it as a serial. He, that's what he said. He said, if you were a famous author, I could serialize it. Right. But we only serialize famous authors. You know, if, uh, otherwise, he says, send me some other stuff. I right. want to see more from you. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I never sent him anything again because sci-fi wasn't my genre. I didn't, I wasn't writing, I wasn't going to write in that area. I, right. I was writing other places. So, you know, mystery was more, you know, uh, in my area. So, uh, so that was just exciting. I felt like I'd gotten some acknowledgement for my writing skill. I did actually lengthen it, turned it into a novella length. And I sent it up to ser- several science fiction book publishers. Nada, got nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you have a nice doorstop for you know, for, you know, for your office, is that right? I've, I've got but, a couple of those. Uh, yeah. So it was, you know, so that was, you know, that was early encouragement I got from, you know, from a from you know an editor to magazine. That was right. exciting for me in, in many ways. Um, but that's not really how I got my start. You know, monetarily, I ended up, you know, shifting into, uh, you know becoming a reporter for a newspaper, mm-hmm. uh, writing advertising copy, and then advertising copy paid better than journalism. Sure. So I'm not pursuing that more. And uh, so the, the more I got involved in that, the better I got. And uh, that led to many, uh, that actually led to everything else. Right. The uh, writing ad copy led to my uh, winning some, you know, pretty big awards in the advertising community. Mm-hmm. I also, 
started getting invitations from a lot of the colleges in town to teach advertising. Wow. And uh, at the time, I had young children at home, and I really couldn't consider it. They, I had three um, schools. They were all, you know, art and advertising type schools. One was called yeah. the Portfolio Center. The other is the Art Institute of Atlanta. And the third one was the Savannah College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. And they had all wanted me to come on as a regular professor, you know, for the whole semester. Right. You know, teaching a, a weekly or a bi-weekly class and I just couldn't commit that kind of time to it so I turned all of them down and said hey I really I'm flattered I really appreciate this and then uh, Georgia State University contacted me through their small business development center mm -hmm. and asked me if I would create a class on you know, kind of do it yourself advertising for small business owners right. and again I said you know I really can't do this this is why and they went wait a minute this is different. We're not looking for someone to come in for the full semester. We're not asking you to come teach at our, our main campus downtown. Uh, this will be done through our uh, continuing education department. And we have a campus on the north end of town, which turned out to be about three miles from my house. Perfect. And they said, you know, we want you to do this in the evening. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, now the evening I can do it. Uh, right. And uh, I said, but still, if us, you know, a full semester, you know, you said not, a, I said, what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. They said, you're designing the class. It can be whatever you want it to be. Right. Uh, you design it to be however long you think it, it will take to, to teach your course. So I designed an eight week class that met twice a week for eight right. weeks and for an hour an evening. Right. Uh, at the end of it, I noticed that most people attended about half the classes. <laughs> so when I did it the next semester, I shortened it to four weeks, one class, and uh, made the, it a longer class. Right, like, so like a like two or three a, hour class. So yeah. I made about a three hour class once right. a week for four weeks. Sure. Um, but the interesting thing was what happened in that first class. Now this was, like I said, it was, it was a class designed for small business owners who wanted to do their own advertising. Right. This was what the Small Business Development Center uh, at Georgia State University said they wanted, and that's how they were marketing the class. Mm -hmm. And it was an oversold class. There were 66 students in that class. Wow. So just a lot. I think it was, yeah. they were expecting like 45 or something. Hopefully and you didn't have to mark papers for all these people. No, no, it wasn't that kind of class. So that, yeah. you know, they weren't getting tested. Sure. Uh, <laughs> there was, you know, it was my curriculum. So it sure. wasn't, they weren't getting course credits. It was, uh, it was for people who, you know, wanted to. People you know, were interested in that. It was, it was right. for interest only. Exactly. Yeah. And so as the people were coming in on that first night, I'm standing at the door polling them to find out what kind of companies they owned, what types of businesses they had. Right. And as, and as I'm asking all these people, they're, by the time they're all in and seated, I hadn't spoken to a single small business owner. <laughs> all of them. Every one of them, almost entirely, there were a few people who wanted to be copywriters at ad agencies. There were like four or five of those, but everybody sure. else, 60 or 61 of them, were advertising sales reps, people who sold ad space. Wow. They were media reps, and they represented every aspect of the media. They were mm -hmm. people from newspapers, radio stations, television stations, uh, the yellow pages, billboard companies, magazines. Everything was there. Uh, and, uh, and, and so after everybody got seated, I'm just dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why these people are here. So I said, why are you people here? I haven't just said, I said, okay, I've asked everybody what they do and I don't know why you people are here. Right. And this one woman raises her hand. She goes, well, I'm here because I work with small business owners and most of them either don't have the money or don't want to spend the money on having an ad agency or a design firm create their ad. Mm -hmm. And they expect me to do that as part of the price of the ad space that I'm selling them. And frankly, I don't know what I'm doing. I came here to learn how to create a more effective ad. Perfect. I mean, good for these people to fi figure that out. I mean, they, exactly. they, under they understood their market. They understood the needs mm -hmm. of their market. And they were looking for a solution. I mean, and it's amazing how few people do that. They say, well, you know, mm -hmm. if they can't come to me with an ad, well, I can't help them. Well, no, uh -huh. let's, let's find a way to help these people that actually have money in their pocket that mm -hmm. want to spend it with me.
Well, and, and then everybody in the class starts nodding and saying, yes, that's why we're here too. <laughs> yes, me like, too. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and I was stunned, but I immediately went, wow, here is a market that wants to know uh, of people that wants to know what I have to talk about. Right. And so when I finished that class, I boiled it down to a one day seminar and started marketing it directly to uh, media outlets and their associations. Sure. And before I knew it, I was, I was speaking all the time and mm -hmm. I was flying around the country talking on advertising, how to create advertising, how to sell more advertising and just right. started building a lot of different programs, you know, starting with that. And that's kind of how I got into the creativity and innovation speeches that I do because I would always do a segment on, on how to come up with ideas for ads. And that was always the, the most popular part of the program I would do. People love that. So sure. I started developing that into its own program and that's been my my flagship uh presentations ever since is talking about um innovation and creative thinking and how to do it yourself how to how to, how to rediscover your own latent uh creative ability your natural creative right. ability which everybody has but most people have suppressed because of the educational system making people conform so much and then showing people how they can harness that ability, that ability to think like an innovator and make their business more competitive. Right. So. Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, going back to, you know, when you start, first started out as a copywriter, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that, that's what that's all about. You know, oh, yeah. you write copies day after day after day after day and make them sound different and make them sound mm -hmm. unique and be able to tell a unique story for, you know, 15 different companies that are all in the same industry oh, is yeah. a real talent, you know, because yeah. all of a sudden, if you, if you throw the same copy at 15 different companies that are all in the same market, that are all in the same industry, you've lost your credibility. <laughs> yeah. It's all you know, got to be different. So, yeah. You know, you need to have the ability to be able to sit there and say, okay, what are the little unique things that make this company different? You know, what are the, what are the little things, you know, what are the nuances? You know, what, is their audience different? Is something that the way they sell different is the way they present themselves different and be able to focus on those little things. And, you know, you're right. There, there are people out there that are, that are tearing down the walls trying to figure this out. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you can help those people and if you can give them the idea that, you know, yes, you are unique. Yes, you are special. No, you are not a commodity. You know, it gives them the tools to be able to go out there and be able to present themselves in a different way. And that, that's a talent. Mm -hmm. and, and what I would do in the class uh, to, to address what you just said is that I would say there is a science to advertising. Yes. It's not rocket science, mm -hmm. but it is a science and it's, it's rooted in psychology. And it's all about basically an advertisement is, is all about what it's doing is, is any product or service solves somebody's problem. I don't care if it's a luxury item. It still may solve an emotional <laughs> problem Absolutely. they're trying to solve. Whatever it may be, every single product and service on the market solves some type of a problem. Yes. And that's what you do in advertising is you, you call out to those people with that problem mm -hmm. and you say, I have a solution. And that's all advertising is about. And if you understand that, if you're, you're, if you're telling these people in your ad what you can do for them, yeah. uh, how you can make their life better, uh, how you can solve their issues, their problems, and this is how it's done. And if an ad is too, you know, you, you can really mess up an ad. No, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, people try to be so either too clever or too funny. Yeah. Uh, I had a, uh, an owner of a software company contact me back in the, uh, Oh, in the early, back in the early 1990s, I'm going to say yeah. the, fairly early on in my career. I mean, I'd been writing ad copy for a number of years, but, sure. um, I had been recommended to this company, uh, by both one of their, uh, clients and by one of their vendors. Mm -hmm. So I came well recommended. This marketing director calls me up, says, we'd like you to come in and talk with us about our, our advertising. And so I, I go in and we 
meet with the woman and we're chatting in this conference room and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of, you know, get acquainted kind of chatting, just, you know, trying to, you know, learn a little bit about each other. And it's been about five minutes and I know she keeps looking down at her watch and yeah. then finally she goes, Oh, by the way, the owner of the company wants to sit in on this meeting uh -huh. and on cue, the door there, flies open. There he is. This florid faced man comes rushing in. And so I start to rise up out of my chair to uh, introduce myself. Yeah. He ignores my hand sticking out. He's holding in his hand this stack of laminated uh, papers. Right. And he slams them down on the table and he goes, if you know so damn much about advertising, you tell me which of those ads worked and which ones didn't. Well, I'm like, whoa, I don't know. I'm assuming you're the president of the company, but I don't know why you're talking to me like this. And my first inclination was to say, I'm out of here. Yeah, thank <laughs> you, you very know, much. I, I appreciate your time. I, we're, we're done. <laughs> we're done. Thank you. But it, it kind of caught me there. I kind of like took a deep breath and counted to 10 and went, I'm curious myself. Yeah. Can I do what he asked me to do? Sure. Can I identify which ads worked and which ones didn't? He didn't offer me any sales reports. No. He didn't tell me where he ran the ads. Yeah. He didn't tell me when he ran the ads with the frequency, gave me zero information other than the physical ad itself. Right. How'd you and do? So I was curious. Can I do this? So yeah. I got the ads and I said, okay, I'll take your challenge. Yeah. And I sat down and it really didn't take me long at all. I went through them and I went, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and just bad, 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 good. <laughs> pretty much. I, so I, that's what I did. I, I narrowed it down and I go, okay, these two right here. Yeah. Probably generated some response, but very little. Mm-hmm. I said, these over here generated zero response. Right. And he goes, you're absolutely right. How can you know that? He's now angry. Yeah. And I'm like, I, and I tried to explain to him a little bit about the science of advertising. Yeah. And I said, okay. Um, and ultimately, the bottom line was uh, we end up not doing any business. He had written the ads. Uh-oh. And, uh, he was, you know, he was expecting me to praise his work. Well, you know, I just trying to be honest with him about yeah. what the problems were with the ads. They were dense blocks of copy that were just, you know, you'd look at it and you go, Oh, I'm not reading that. Turn the page. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of the ones that I, I gave zero response to were trying to be funny mm -hmm. and had almost nothing to do with the products, the product he was selling. Right. And the only thing it did say was a lot of bragging about his company, mm -hmm. about how they had been, you know, selling so much. And they were, it had been, this is the, uh, what I left out of the story at the beginning. It had been a software company making a business application that had been extremely successful. Right. And then what happened was they started generating some publicity. They started sending out some press releases and got a lot of publicity, mm -hmm. which attracted the interest of other software makers who entered the market where he'd been the sole seller of the, of a product. So all of Suddenly, a sudden he's lost his, co he's, he's lost his edge. He's lost, you know, he's lost his, you know, his differentiation. Well, and, yeah, uh, suddenly yeah. there were other competitors. Exactly. And, and, and so that's what, and, and, and in the end, I heard, you know, sometime later that he ended up selling out to one of the competitors because mm -hmm. he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't market fast enough. He didn't, it, the company was too small. And a lot of the, um, the competitors were really big companies that, you know, had more, uh, you know, ability to get out into the market faster and oh, take sure. over his market share. So, uh, and in many ways, you know, some people say, Oh, you know, any publicity is good publicity. This was publicity that shot himself in the foot. Yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately he never recovered from it. Uh, but, uh, like I said, we ended up not doing any business, but, uh, it was, uh, it was a good learning experience for me because up until that point in time, I had not considered, you know, how to identify whether a, a, an ad is works or not. But now right. today, or, you know, I have pretty much since then, I could look at any ad and go, yeah, that's not going to work. Right. Or, you know, this ad's going to work. This is ad, this ad is good for these reasons. Sure. And uh, so it's, uh, it was a good lear learning experience.
And, and you know, and that's what it is. That's what a lot of things is, 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 you know, I mean, I grew up in the direct mail business mm -hmm. and with the direct mail business. It's all about test. You know, mm -hmm. you know, figure out what you did right, figure out what you did wrong, you know, evaluate, you know, reassess, rebuild, mm -hmm. retest again, and keep going. And, you know, a lot of companies today are not willing to take the time to evaluate what went right, what went wrong, mm -hmm. you know, change and move forward. You know, they say, well, advertising doesn't work because I did it once and, you know, I, I wrote one ad and I put it in one magazine and, it, and I never, you know, I never got any money for it. So advertising doesn't work. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, and there's a lot thousands, of they would, thousands of stories like that. And a lot of times they would blame the media. Absolutely. And, 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 and a lot of times it was the quality of the ad yeah. and not the media because, uh, you know, again, a lot of these small companies go and expect the uh, ad salesman to create their ad and they don't know what they're doing. A lot of times they would just put the name of the company and, you know, a lot of these, <laughs> what would, would crack me up and, and the uh, owner of the company said, well, I want my grandson's picture put in the ad. <laughs> Why? And they just do it. They would they would put in it whatever the guy would say. Sure, because he's spending they money. weren't they weren't creative people. That no. was not their and and they they were just trying to sell the ad space. And then unfortunately, if the ad didn't work, the 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 company owner would go, oh well, newspaper advertising doesn't work, or radio advertising doesn't work, or you know whatever the media. They would blame the media and not yeah. the ad. Exactly. It, and, and so in my, and like you said, you know, what should be looked at first, uh, David Ogilvy said, you know, if your ad fails, talking about a print ad, uh, don't change anything but the headline. That's right. Because if the headline didn't get them into the body copy, then that's the only thing you need to change. And that's where you should spend most of your advertising money is on that headline. Because if the headline doesn't stop them in their tracks, Nothing they're not going to read any further. That's right. But if the headline does, then people will, will get further to find out what the benefit is to them. Exactly. And so, so if, if an ad fails or direct mail kit, and I've done a lot of direct mail, mm -hmm. you know, you change the envelope teaser is the oh, first yeah. thing to change. If, if, they had, if, if, the, if, if you didn't get the response you were looking for, they probably didn't open it. That's so right. you have to go back to that's essentially the headline, the envelope teaser. That's right. How do you, and, how do you get people to open up an envelope? I mean, we did bumpy mail for years, you know, mm -hmm. just sit there and say, what's in this thing? What, you know, what, oh, yeah. you know, there's something other than a, than a piece of paper in this thing. Got to open it. Got to take a look. Uh -huh. you know, exactly. And, you know, it works. Oh yeah. You no, know, in today's world, direct mail is becoming more and more popular again because you have an entire generation of millennials that have never had envelopes addressed to them before. You're not fighting with 10,000 different emails or social media or all those things. It's a more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. You might be one of three in a stack of, 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 of mail that they're getting that comes to their front door. And then they're curious. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if, if you can justify it, if you can, if, if the ROI is there, direct mail is, you know, is, is as live today as it ever was it's just more specific. Well, I, I think it's always been the best, um, best advertising medium. And then, of course, email is, is kind of close related yeah. to direct mail. They're similar in that regard. But I think it's the, it's the best because here's the thing about direct mail that a lot of people don't really consider. If I decide to open it, then I have decided to attend that and read that. Whereas all other advertising is interrupting something else you're doing. If That's you're right. reading a newspaper or magazine, the ad is just, it's in the way of the article you're trying to read. If you're watching television, that ad comes on, you're irritated because you were into the story you were watching. That's this what is the PBR is for, so you can, you can fast forward it. Exactly, you know, and then, you know, radio, the same thing. If you're listening to the radio, ad comes on, you know, that's, you wanted to listen to music or, a talk show or whatever it was. That's right. You know, so in most instant instances, the uh, of, of media, the advertisement interrupts the attention of the person attending that media, but yeah. direct mail doesn't. If I choose to open it, then that I, my, that's where my focus is a hundred percent on that. And you can target it so well, so, so much more than you can target any other media. Everything else is a broadcast. Yeah. It's a, you know, well, email 
marketing isn't. I, I kind of lump those two together. Direct mail and email marketing, in my opinion, are pretty much the same. Oh, yeah. Have, I've had casino. You know, we did a uh, casino mailer uh, for, for a company, and we were getting 45% response rate month after month after month. Mm -hmm. The more specific data you have on your clients, mm -hmm. the better the open rate. And it's, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we could talk about this forever. You know, oh, we I mean, could. We could. I mean, yeah. I, you know, this is this is a whole new show that we could get into. But oh, yeah. you know, I've, I've I've taken up your time, and I appreciate your time, and I, I want to leave you with one last question. Okay. Now, when you leave a meeting, or you walk out of a training session, or you get in your car and you walk away, what's the one thing you want people to think about when you're not in the room? Okay, well, let's just narrow it down to, you know, if I've given a presentation. You bet. Then, then I'm hoping that they, you know, that they take away whatever my, my primary point was. If it's, um, if I've given a presentation on innovation and creative thinking, I hope that they walk away with the idea that thinking more like an innovator mm -hmm. gives them to me, it's, it, it's just opens up so many worlds and it's, it's just such a wonderful, I want to share the joy I have found from the creative process with people. It, Cause to me, there's nothing more fulfilling and satisfying than being embroiled in some creative activity. Absolutely. But at the same time, I want them to know that it really opens up them to recognize opportunities that others will miss, whether it's in their personal life or in their business. Well, the more they learn to think and like think creatively, think more like an innovator, they will recognize opportunities others will miss. Gotcha. And I hope that that and the joy of the creative process is what they walk away with it. Cause that's what I want to give them because it's meant so much to me. That's what I'm attempting to share with them mm -hmm. is what I have found. Uh, has been just a, a, an awesome um, talent or ability, and anybody can have it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rob, thank you very much for your time. You know, you've been absolutely va valuable to me and my audience. I appreciate everything you do. How do people find you? What's, what's, your, what's the website? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, uh, I have two websites, and... Um, the first one is for my speaking business, which I call jumpstartyourmeeting.com. So jumpstartyourmeeting.com if you want to know more about me as a speaker. As a writer, my website is robwilsondirect.com. But if you can't remember that, if you can just remember my name, and don't look for Rob Wilson. There's a million of us out there. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. But if you can yeah. remember my full name, Robert Evans Wilson Jr., you can find everything you want about me online. It's, I become easy to find when you use my full name, Robert Evans Wilson Jr., well, I'll make sure that I put you, both those websites in, you know, into the notes so everybody can find you. So thank you much for your time. Hang out for a second. I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody, and I'll be right back. Thanks a lot, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. I want to thank you, Rob, for being on the show today. It is all about understanding what makes you different, what makes you special, what makes you unique, understanding why should people care about you and why should they come to you for answers. And that's what this is all about. This is what life is about. When you can communicate that, when you can let people understand how you can provide them value, they'll stop looking at you as a commodity and they'll start looking at you as a partner. My name is Ben Baker. My company is Your Brand Marketing. Now, nine to five, Monday to Friday, what do we do? We work with you to understand who you are, what you do, why you do it, and why people should care. We consult, we do workshops, and we do keynote addresses. We look forward to speaking to you. But every Wednesday at 10 o'clock on the West Coast, this is the YourLivingBrand.Live show. We'll see you next week.